evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Affairs Forum. Uh, if we had a, our slides running a little too fast, so if you didn't catch the <laughs> next to the last one, uh, a quote from Confucius that said, if you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves. <laughs> um, that could uh, definitely apply to the subject of trade, I would assume, and I'm sure Professor Levinson will have some uh, insights on that. Now, we are very privileged tonight to have uh, uh, someone who has survived 20 years at the University of Michigan as a professor. Uh, but uh, not only did he survive, but he went on to uh, even uh, bigger and better things. Uh, he was a professor of economics uh, at the University of Michigan and is now a professor and an economist at Yale University. He runs Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. If you have a chance, go online and look at uh, some of the things that are on there from the Jackson Institute uh, because he brings together practitioners and uh, the, the theory behind uh, economics. Now, I have to tell you an economics joke. Um, this is not mine, it's Harry Truman's. Uh, he, he said that uh, every time he's briefed by an economist, uh, they will say on the one hand and on the other hand. And so he said, I'm trying to hire a one-armed economist. <laughs> In any case, um, Professor Levinson uh, runs this wonderful Jackson Institute, and uh, it is uh, a, a really a school for looking at international affairs in a very deep and uh, very, uh, I think, practical way. Before that, as I mentioned, he was at the University of Michigan, and he has deep roots here in northern Michigan, and he works in the fields of international economics and development, developmental economics. Uh, he has uh, also worked in uh, numerous parts of the world and traveled uh, extensively, uh, so he brings uh, with him uh, a lot of practical knowledge about how economics work in the real world. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest tonight, uh, Professor Jim Levinson. So we'll, uh, first I'd like to thank my, my hosts. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Thanks to all of you for coming out uh, tonight. Uh, it's great to see people interested uh, in, in international affairs. Um, as was just said, I run Yale's version of a school of global affairs. And one of the joys of my job is getting to work with just amazingly talented young people. Um, who are dedicated to pursuing careers in public service. Uh, what we've done at the Jackson Institute is to try to combine the traditional academic approach to uh, bringing in practitioners, and it's, it's been a lot of fun to try to build a school. Uh, that said, New Haven's not Michigan, and it is just absolutely wonderful to be back here uh, to be back in northern Michigan. So, uh, what I want to talk about tonight is what I'm calling the economics behind the politics of US trade with China. So, the politics of trade with China are complicated, which is a, a phrase we sometimes use when we, when we want to say they're just messed up. Um, when it, uh, Don, Don was saying economy, he was always, you know, the, the joke about the, the, on the one hand, on the other hand, you need a, a one-armed economist. But the truth is, when it comes to international trade, economists are pretty much of one mind. And that is that free trade is beneficial to, the, to both parties uh, that engage in it, both countries. And yet, that's not where we are. So what I want to talk about is, if free trade is so great, how did we end up here? Because it's not a Republican versus Democrat traditional divide. In the presidential election a couple years ago, a year ago, feels like a couple years ago, 
Um, politici you know, uh, politicians on the left, uh, I put Bernie Sanders up here because he's still a, a sitting senator, and obviously politicians on the right, um, were very anti-free trade, okay? And I, I could have put Hillary Clinton up there. Uh, no matter who had got the nomination for the Democratic uh, side of the ticket, the, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was dead on arrival, no matter who had the nomination and no matter who won the election. And what I'd like to do is step back a little bit tonight and ask why is it that politicians on the right and on the left are pretty much anti-free trade right now? Uh, I think a politician who would stand up and run on a platform of free trade would be pretty brave and arguably not terribly politically savvy right now. So what I'd like to do this evening is spend some time talking about kind of how we got here. And I want to leave as much time as possible for Q&A. Uh, I think this is a topic on which many people have ideas and views, and I think we'll all learn from uh, some back and forth. So the plan is the following. I want to start off and say a little bit about why it is that economists tend to be pretty much in agreement when it comes to uh, thinking about free trade. And then say a little bit about China and China's rise, because I think one of the reasons, and only one, but one of the reasons that we've landed where we have um, is, is related to the rise of China. China's actually pretty different. Uh, and I want to talk about the ways in which uh, China is different. So on the one hand, we've seen the rise of China. Uh, the other thing that's going on, though, is changes in U.S. labor markets. And I think that to really understand the politics in this country, one needs to understand how U.S. labor markets have adjusted to the increase in trade. And I'll look at that through a few different perspectives. I want to look at it uh, in terms of regional employment impacts. Are there particular parts of the country that have been especially hard hit? Uh, national versus regional impacts and whether or not um, wages have, have been impacted by, by uh, increased trade with China. A lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is research conducted by a wide range of economists, uh, and I want to be upfront that I'm synthesizing and trying to interpret a lot of this research, but most of it's not mine. Um, colleagues, David Otter at MIT, Gordon Hansen at the University of uh, California, San Diego, have been at the forefront of a lot of just wonderful research trying to understand uh, what's been the impact of the increased trade with China on our economy. And I'm going to then sort of try to lay out why what's new in terms of the economics of how labor markets um, adjust uh, leads to sort of new politics. And I'll circle back at the end and try to explain at least my interpretation of why it is that we see politicians on the right and on the left um, arguing against free trade. So let's start with just a little bit of background. And uh, as Don said, I, I'm, I'm a professor, but I'm going to try really hard not to, uh, not to lecture too much. I'll give a very, very brief um, background on why you really don't need a one-armed economist when it, when it comes to free trade. There are a lot of things that virtually, I think, all economists would agree on. So let's talk about what those are. First off, at a national level, it's widely understood that free trade is good for a country. And by that, I mean if you don't have barriers to trade, the winners from trade will benefit by enough that they could, in principle, compensate the losers and still have something left over. Now, that's all well and fine in theory, 
and in practice, winners don't end up compensating the losers, and we're going to want to spend some time thinking about what happens when that's the case. Economists have well understood and, and widely held views as to who wins and loses from trade. Some of these, I think, are all understood by, by, by most of us. Uh, when you buy imported goods, you benefit. So I'm not going to ask people to uh, look inside the labels of their shirts. It would make for an interesting uh, experiment, but I, I don't think we're going to run that experiment right now. Um, but I'm guessing very, very few people here are wearing shirts uh, or dresses made in America. Okay? And the fact that you bought clothes that were made overseas benefited you. You wouldn't have bought it otherwise. You could have spent more money and bought clothes made uh, locally. And some people do. You always have that option. But most people don't. Uh, sometimes you don't have the option, or not much of one. Uh, many of us start our day with a cup of coffee. Absent free trade, uh, estimates are that a cup of coffee would cost 60 or 70 bucks. Okay? Because in the United States, very little coffee is grown. Uh, Hawaii grows a little bit. And, you know, if we truly, truly shut down trade, you might try to come up with a few ways to grow a little bit more coffee. But for the most part, the United States is not well suited to growing coffee. So people who, who uh, consume imported goods, and that includes all of us, uh, we benefit from that. Perhaps a little less obvious is that when you consume a good that is also exported, in fact, you're losing out a little bit because the price is a little higher. The fact that consumers overseas are willing to buy the products that we export drives that price up a little bit, and you're paying a little bit more. In terms of producers, uh, we tend to hear more from producers. Uh, the benefits that accrue to consumers are widely dispersed. Okay? If there is a trade policy that cuts back, puts a tariff, for example, on uh, socks, you know, are, are we going to get all wound up? Probably not. You'll just pay a little bit more for your socks. Uh, on the other hand, producers tend to get uh, much more, or, tend to be much more organized and much more vociferous. And producers of uh, exported goods benefit. The really big exporters in the United States, uh, aircraft. Uh, I happen to work in one of the largest export industries in the United States right now, which is higher education. Uh, and producers of import and competing goods lose. So when a steel factory closes, and people allege that it is because of competition from Korea or China, uh, wherever, uh, people will, will, you know, the, the owners of those factories tend to be, be pretty vociferous. So those are the winners and losers. Uh, something else that economists tend to agree on is that the more different the countries trading are from one another, the bigger these effects are. And that's going to prove to be an important thing that I hope you'll keep in mind over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. Because the United States is starting to trade with countries that are a lot different than, than the trading partners we traded with uh, post-World War II. And this last point is, is uh, an important one. When people within the United States can move around, trade may impact wages, but it's going to do so nationally, not locally. So if a factory closes in Akron, but people can move, wages fall a little bit, but a lot of those people who lose their jobs in Akron move to Phoenix, to Atlanta, to Nashville, to other places. So the mobility within a country has a lot to do with muting the impact of trade. And, and I actually think that uh, if you got a group of 20 professional economists in the room, every single one of them uh, would agree with this. I don't think anything here is the least bit controversial. So what did this all mean for U.S. trade until about 1990? Because up until 1990, trade was a pretty popular item. 
Okay? You don't have to, many of you in the room can remember back to the early 1990s. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, passed the North American Free Trade Agreement. Bipartisan support for that. Uh, it, was a, it was a popular policy. Um, there were pockets, some of those pockets uh, well here, here well in Michigan, uh, that weren't so happy about it. But overall, uh, the NAFTA was, was, was widely welcomed. Um, and in general, people believed that trade was, was a pretty good thing up through about 1990. But in 1990, or around thereabouts, a few things happened. One, people noticed that inequality in the United States was rising, and people noticed that manufacturing employment was falling. And suspect number one was globalization, of which international trade is, is the main part. And economists spent a fair amount of time thinking about whether or not uh, globalization was responsible for this, and I think the answer is probably not, and for two reasons. Uh, in terms of the decline in U.S. manufacturing, for sure it's happening, but it's important to realize that's been happening since the 1960s. If you look at a graph of U.S. manufacturing, it started going down in the early 1960s, and it's just continued to go down, and yet globalization showed up uh, much more later. So the timing doesn't work for that. And the rise in inequality, again, the timing's not right. Most economists would argue that the increase in inequality that we've seen over the last couple decades is due to what, what is called skill-biased technical change, that technology has changed such that it rewards highly educated people uh, proportionately more and those without the education get left behind. The fact that it's due to technology and not trade is important from a policy perspective because if it was due to trade, we'd know how to fix it. Okay, if the increase in inequality that we see was due to international trade, well, you might, if you thought inequality was something you wanted to address, you might shut down international trade or at least mute it. You have that policy tool with tariffs, with quotas, with treaties. You don't have that tool with technology. Okay? You can't really tell people to become Luddites. Um, so because technology is probably the main driver to increase in inequality, we don't have the policy lever uh, that, that we might with in the case of international trade. So it wasn't... Uh, Global, globalization probably wasn't at fault for these things. And up until, as I said, uh, the early 1990s, free trade was pretty popular. So if you had asked, uh, if I was giving a talk about the impact of trade and the politics and that we were, had rolled the clock back 25 years, um, probably would have said that trade hadn't been a big factor behind the rising wage inequality. And I would have said, okay, sure, factories shut down in various places, but people can move, and that mutes the impact. And that means that the labor market impacts of trade are going to be shared among all low-skilled workers, not just the ones who happen to be in cities or towns that are exposed to international trade. So while there was an understanding that trade could be redistributive in practice, I think people up until the mid-1990s viewed it as pretty benign. Uh, it could be distributive in theory. In practice, it, it was viewed to be pretty benign. So what happened uh, over the last 20, 20, 25 years? And I'm going to argue that there are really two things. And one of them is the rise of China. And it's hard to... Um, it's hard to overemphasize the changes that have happened in China over the last 25 years. We take it now for granted that China is a major economic power, okay? But 25 years ago, they were a non-presence. Um, so if, if you look, the red, the red line is China's share of world manufacturing exports. And in the early 1990s, it was, it was like 2%. Okay? China was not a player. 
Um, and you could look at this, there are different ways. Some people will look at this and say, oh my goodness, China's become uh, this huge uh, manufacturing player, and that's true. Some people might view that as, as, uh, having, as threatening. Uh, I would remind you that concurrent with this, at least since about the mid-1980s, up through uh, about 2010, a half a billion people in China moved out of poverty. It's probably the largest single example of poverty alleviation in the history of our planet. Half a billion people who had been in poverty no longer are. So let's not lose sight of that. But it, it, the rise of China, though, is, has been absolutely remarkable. But the United States has traded with lots of countries for a long time. And China, though, I'm going to argue, is really different from the trade that the United States had been engaging in post Bretton Woods, post World War II. And it's different for a number of reasons. So why? Why is China so different? The first is that the rise of China, what you just saw there in that graph, that was a surprise. It was not anticipated. So in preparing for this talk, I went back and I looked up the centennial issue of the Wall Street Journal. So in 1989, just before the rise of China, the Wall Street Journal predicted which countries would be the winners and losers over the next 100 years. Okay? And the winners in 1980, so this is 1989, Wall Street Journal, highly respected financial uh, newspaper, predicted that over the next 100 years, the three biggest winners um, would be Bangladesh, Thailand, and Zimbabwe. Okay? Think about that. And, and these were not controversial predictions in 1989. Okay. Uh, they, you know, in fairness to the Wall Street Journal, they, they batted 333, which isn't bad for a baseball team. Um, Thailand has done remarkably well relative uh, to 1989. Bangladesh, uh, I'm doing some work there now, you know, not so much. Uh, and Zimbabwe, boy, you know, <laughs> it's hard to imagine getting that one more wrong. Um, in addition to predicting the winners, they predicted the biggest losers which countries would fall most far behind. And the Wall Street Journal's number one predicted loser in 1989, who do you think that was? It was China. You're absolutely right. Okay? And again, it's, we have to kind of roll the tape back. But we need to remember that in 1989, China was pretty closed, hadn't traded with the rest of the world. Um, it, you know, huge, you know, hundreds of millions of people living in poverty, measured as under one or two dollars a day. Um, the fact that China's rise was not anticipated is important. Because if you know something's coming, you can do things to get ready for it. But the international economy, because it wasn't just the United States, uh, the rest of the world did not anticipate what was about to happen. Another thing that's different about China is that its growth was not driven by commodities. So if you looked at the other countries that had come onto the scene in a big way and that the United States traded with, their growth was commodity driven. Brazil, iron ore was a big part of it. Indonesia, the rubber industry. Russia had oil and gas. China had something different. China had people. And that's going to make a difference when we think about the labor market impacts of, of trade with China. Another thing to keep in mind is that China was emerging from a period of relative isolation. And what that means is there was a lot of room to catch up. The World Trade Organization, um, Big changes happened there also. Uh, China was granted uh, PNTR, Permanent Normal Trade Relations, in 2001. 
And what this meant was that China knew it could now get, on a regular basis, uh, most favored nation tariffs, which were on the order of 3 or 4 percent, instead of 37 percent. So goods from China became a lot less expensive. And China is also so big that the U.S. trade with it uh, generates some macroeconomic issues. I'm not going to spend too much time on those. Um, I would want to remind people, though, that al although we're going to talk a lot about trade imbalances with China, there's no reason to expect the United States to run a trade, uh, not uh, e to have balanced trade with any particular country. Okay, and China's no exception. Uh, overall, you might expect trade to be balanced um, over time across all one's trading partners, but there's no reason to think trade should be balanced on a country by country bilateral basis. So China really was different, and it's going to be different yet again. So I think trade impacts in the future will be different than what they've been. China is uh, the huge increase we've seen in competition from China. Um, that's about over. China is now confronting, and some would say struggling, with the challenges of being uh, high, I mean, a, a, a middle-income country. Um, it's got a growth rate that the United States would, you know, would love to have, but it's, China's growth rate is, is moderate compared to what it had been. Uh, and China's um, unlikely to continue to see those big changes we saw. So we saw, you know, a lot of things changed, big surprises, and, and that period, I think, is about over. So how has the U.S. labor market adjusted to this huge increase in trade with China? And I think understanding how labor markets have adjusted has a lot to do with understanding the politics of where we are now. So I'm going to look at this a few different ways. I want to look at regional employment impacts. Has trade with China been spread out across the United States? Or are there particular parts of the country that have been uh, hard hit? I want to look at whether or not um, wages have fallen, what's happened to employment. And we'll do this in turn. So let's start by looking at regional employment impacts. And I want to put a map up here. And it's a map that takes a little bit of thinking to get our heads around what it is. Conditional. Go back one step. Conditional on manufacturing employment, what's been the impact of trade with China? So, what you see here is there are some regions where trade with China has been especially hard hit. Um, if you look up in the Northeast, this is what's been the impact over about 25 years. Um, See how this works? If I have a pointer, I might. Maybe not. Sorry about that. Um, the Northeast has been hard hit. Uh, take a look at Michigan. I'm guessing 98% of the people in the, in, in the room already have. Um, <laughs> Michigan has obviously a fair amount of manufacturing, okay? But it's, it's not very impacted by trade with China. Why is that? Well, what, you know, most of men, a, a large amount of the manufacturing in uh, Michigan is transportation related. Yeah, I mean, walk down Front Street and tell me how many Chinese cars you see. Okay, and the answer is almost surely zero. Um, that's going to change, by the way. Okay, uh, 25 years ago, um, you didn't see any Korean cars. Okay, and over the next 20 years, China is, is likely to move sort of up the ladder of, of uh, value and, and start to export cars. But they're not there now. And what you see from a picture like this, though, is that the impact of trade with China is very geographically focused. Um, the Southeast has a fair amount of manufacturing, but it's often heavy manufacturing, and in the southeast, um, the countries that those firms are competing for in manufacturing tend to be European countries. Germany is, is a major player in heavy manufacturing, heavy industry, rather, 
So what we see is um, when you start to do a little bit of research and, and look at what's happened, you see that wages in these areas that have been hard hit, they fall. Okay? And they fall for everybody. They don't just fall for people who are, uh, say, don't have a, a college education. Um, they fall everywhere, and they fall in and out of manufacturing. And maybe that's not a surprise. When a factory closes, restaurants, uh, hotels, uh, service industry, accountants, the whole economy uh, takes the hit. So economists are fond of quantifying things. And this is a, a summary of, of research trying to quantify the employment impacts of trade with China. Uh, and a key number here is that across all education levels, um, manufacturing employment uh, is probably fallen by about 0.6. Un let me get this right. Unemployment is about 0.6 percentage points higher. Um, and that's true uh, across all workers. Uh, it's muted a bit. People who are higher education uh, are a little less harmed by, by trade. But unemployment is an issue. People leave the labor market. And one of the things that I want to spend some time thinking about is how communities adjust. So we've seen that uh, exposure to trade is regionally specific, regionally concentrated. Um, I'm representing to you based on, on the research that we see that wages fall and they tend to fall for all education levels. And we see that employment falls in and out of manufacturing. But something strange has happened in the last 20 years. And that is that the population in these areas that, has been hard, that have been hard hit has not fallen, not as much as we'd expect. And one of the real puzzles, and I think much of what I've told you tonight, at some level you know if you read the newspaper, and what I'm about to tell you I think is a little less well understood. You would think in this age, day and age, mobility would be at an all-time high. It's easy to stay in touch with family. You have FaceTime, you have the internet, you have Skype. Some of us remember trying to make long-distance phone calls on the weekend so you'd avoid the high rates. I mean, all of that stuff is ancient history. Okay, airfares uh, are, his, in real terms, historically very, very low. It's easy to fly, relatively easy, modulo. Uh, if every airport had TSA like Traverse City, we, I, I'd, I'd say it's easy to get around. Um, so all of these things suggest, you, lead us to think that mobility would be high. And in fact, mobility, geographic mobility now I'm talking about, geographic mobility in the US is at an almost all-time low. So what's happened over these last 25 years? Just as China and the trade that accompanied the rise of China hit the US labor markets, people are turning out to be a whole lot more stuck in place than we ever would have guessed. And there are probably at least three reasons for this. And one, and, and they're not things that jump to mind as an economist, but when people looked into the data, um, a few things pop up. One is the rise of dual career couples, OK? It used to be that if the wage earner lost, I mean, he'd be sexist, but it probably was a his job back then, lost his job, family could move. But now it's not so obvious, because you have a lot of dual career households, and when one of them loses their job, they're a lot less likely to just pick up and leave, because the other one may still be employed. Second reason is, again, not something you'd jump out at as an economist, it's the rise in dual custody divorces. Okay? 25 years ago, before the China trade shock, when people, I mean, people got divorced then, they get divorced now, but when they got divorced then, traditionally, the mother got custody of the kids. Okay? Today, dual custody is the, the norm. What that means, though, in many, many states, 
if one of the parents leaves the state, they lose custody. Okay? And from there, it's obvious, mobility is not as easy as it used to be. And the third reason is that post the financial crash, and we've had a couple of them over the last 25 years, but especially post the most recent financial crash, 20, 28, 29, 2010, a lot of households were underwater on their mortgages. And what that means is if they left and sold their house, they would owe money. Okay, and they, they were unable to take that on. Um, so the combination of these three things has led people to be a lot more stuck in place than they had been in the past. And this has big implications for labor markets. So when a factory closes down or an industry shuts down in an entire state, uh, if you can move, the impact of that on, on, on wages is going to be muted because it's going to be spread by, across workers throughout the entire country. When workers are not completely stuck in place, but much more frozen in place than they have been in the past, the impacts of these trade shocks, as economists call, call it, uh, is, is not muted and is, is very region-specific. And I believe that this actually has pretty big implications for understanding the politics of trade with China. In terms of national versus regional impacts, just talked a little bit about that. It's worth thinking, though, when we trade with China, we are, in fact, trading. Okay? We're buying things from China. So aren't there going to maybe be some employment benefits from those industries that should benefit from trade with China. So you could imagine, are they going to, asking whether there are going to be employment gains in the industries where we're selling to China? And what about those industries that buy inputs that are low-cost inputs from China? It makes the output of those industries more competitive. Might they also have increases in employment? And the answer, sadly, is no. There are benefits to trade with China, um, but they show up much more in profits than they do in employment. Uh, we just don't see them showing up in the employment numbers. I want to just mention a couple other margins on which uh, you could see responses to trade with China. Um, we've, I've talked mostly about employment, and I think employment is probably the most visible one. When people in a community lose a job, it's pretty obvious. When people in a community take a 4% wage cut, not so obvious. Um, wages do fall. And people have done studies to look at what's been the impact of trade with China on wages. But the answer is the decline in wages is very, very modest. Um, hasn't, been, uh, hasn't been big at all. One of the things that's interesting is what's happened to government benefits because of increased trade with China. People lose their jobs. Um, if you lose your job because of international trade, you qualify for something called trade adjustment assistance. Uh, have people um, collected a lot more? And the answer there is no. It hasn't been big. The big impact of people, of transfer transfers from people who lose their job with China doesn't show up on the employment side. It shows up on the disability and medical side. Um, a lot more disability. I have a colleague at Yale named Peter Schott who's doing some fascinating work showing that communities that have had big impacts from trade with China are some of the same communities that are suffering uh, the most from the opioid crisis. So these are some of the impacts that are a little less obvious, perhaps a little more subtle. So step back for a second and kind of talk, put, put, try to put the two pieces together. Um, what we've seen is that we've got labor markets where people are much more stuck in place than they have been. 
We've got the impact of trade showing up in employment, not wages, so it's pretty obvious. People are stuck. And at the same time, we've got this tremendous and unexpected increase in trade with China. So when some workers and some communities and perhaps some states argue that trade with China has really hurt them, they're not imagining it. It really has happened. This is stuff that we have talked about. So as I said, for some workers, the impact of uh, trade with China is very, very real. And what's a little bit frustrating is that rather than really try to fix this problem and address the challenges from where I stand, I see politicians trying to capitalize on it. And they're not trying to fix the problem. They're not really addressing what's at issue here. Um, and instead of, of, of that, we end up with this. So with that, why don't we open it up to questions, but thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and let me uh, encourage you to raise your hand and uh, make yourself known to the wonderful folks who have microphones. Uh, in the meantime, let me uh, repeat a question from Fred Kural. Fred teaches the Great Decisions Program at, uh, and I'm here at NMC's uh, Extended Education. And um, he's, he's really raised some fascinating, couple of fascinating points here that relate directly to what you were talking about. Um, basically that American consumers have voted that they want cheap television sets, maybe not cheap Chinese cars because they're too dangerous, but um, uh, anything else that's coming out of China we seem to be receptive to, and that's our fault, therefore, that we've made an a economic decision uh, that a $300 35-inch TV set is more important than a job for somebody making TVs in Michigan. And uh, he asked this very cleverly, uh, uh, disguised question, uh, well, if Walmart is buying all their stuff in China, why doesn't the president focus on doing the production in Mexico? And therefore, we can solve two problems at once. So is there, is there, a, is there a, an angle here? Is China maybe moving out of the production world, and uh, is there now an opportunity? Well, it's a great question. Um, it's important to realize China is not the only one out there, okay? So if, you, if uh, the, our government decided they wanted to beat up on China, hypothetically speaking, um, if our government decided that, you have to keep in mind there's also Vietnam waiting in the wings, there's Indonesia, there are a lot, a lot of low-wage countries that are more than happy to uh, supply goods, and in many cases, high-quality goods at low cost. Um, so this focus on China, I understand because of China's size why it's so important, but where we are now with trade with China, it's kind of the new normal. So even if China grows out of being the low-wage economy, uh, it'll next be a Vietnam, and, and there are many, many others after that. You know, to the question of is this, um, I almost heard it as saying, well, it's Americans' own fault because we're buying these inexpensive goods. I, I don't think of it as fault. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I'm an economist. I tend to think markets work. And I think that if, uh, if people want to buy uh, shirts that have been made out of, out of cloth woven in America, of cotton grown in America, and then put together by American uh, seem, you know, people who, who, apparel workers, they can do that. Okay, and there are, plenty, there are plenty of companies out there that, that sell that product, and if you want to spend $135 on your shirt, go for it. Um, and if everybody decided that, that's okay. But I, I have a little bit of a problem with the idea that the person who decides to buy a shirt from uh, Land's End that was made in China, I, I don't think of them as being unpatriotic or at fault. How about moving the uh, production to, to Mexico or... Uh might solve a sec well, second problem at the same time. It, or they are not able to produce that for us. Uh, 
I mean, again, I think it's a little dangerous when governments, well, our government, or probably any other, but especially our government, starts telling companies where they have to produce. Um, there are certain products that companies naturally want to produce in Mexico. With the passage of NAFTA, wire harnesses all went south of the border. It's very labor intensive and a complement to car manufacturing. Um, you know, is Mexico well suited to make televisions? Not so obvious. Um, again, I, I, I tend to think markets work pretty well. Our former NMC student and uh, graduate from University of Michigan, Emma Jabour, handing you the microphone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to a point you made. My name is Ed Dolan from Northport. Um, I wanted to go back to a point you made about uh, low labor mobility, interstate labor mobility being one of the problems. I wonder if you could say a few things about uh, whether or not some of that mobility is amenable to policy changes. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to change uh, dual custody divorces with major policy changes, but I'm thinking about things like uh, occupational licensing. I'm thinking about things like health care policy, health care uh, that's not fully portable mm -hmm. state to state. I'm thinking about things like uh, <clears throat> when people who lose their jobs go on benefits, like you uh, point out they do, those benefits are structured in a way that they have very high effective marginal tax rates, things like that. What's, uh, could you just comment a little bit on that family of things? Sure. Um, for sure, there are policies that could make mobility uh, easier, um, or moving easier and increase mobility. Um, the healthcare one, I think, is, is one that you just mentioned. Um, so, you know, uh, we, could, we could wipe out people who were, you know, we could bail out people who were underwater on mortgages. Okay? It's doable. It's expensive. And it sets up all kinds of moral hazard problems, but it's, it's in the feasible set. Um, so, yeah, I think there are some things we can do. I think some of the really big things, though, like dual career households, um, it's, little, it's not obvious how, how you, th that's a fact of life now. Um, and, and when you introduce dual career households um, into the equation, I think that's a first order change. I think that's a whole lot more important than making healthcare por portable, for example. And, you know, I, I don't see an, an, an obvious solution to that one. Hi. Um, I've heard a lot of folks argue that uh, technology uh, is, brings a lot of economic benefits through productivity gains and things like that, and yet you said uh, technology is causing inequality. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering what, what do economists think of is tech, as technology, and am I looking at this as an apples and oranges kind of problem? So. I, it's important to keep in mind the uh, following idea. Um, and that is, trade policy can move production back to the United States. Okay? If you have restrictionist, and I, I will get to your question. I mean, if you have really restrictionist trade policies, you can move production to the U.S. Okay? Uh, the previous question, if you didn't want your TVs made in China, you could set up policies so the TVs would be made in, in, as they used to be in Lafayette, Indiana. But nowadays, when you bring production back, you're not bringing jobs back. And it's that disconnect that is so key to understanding the, I think, the economics and the politics of, of these policies. About eight years ago, um, I volunteered for a project run by the Sloan Foundation that wanted to get academic economists to go actually visit factories. And I thought, I, I study this kind of stuff, I write about it, and the truth was I hadn't spent much time, okay, full disclosure, any time, on a, uh, on a factory floor. So I, I spent six months uh, spending a lot of time visiting factories around the country. And the one that, I, uh, that stuck with me the most was a textile factory. And I think it might have been South Carolina. And it was huge. It was acres, acres. And I didn't see a single worker. Even the floors were swept by robots. Okay? Um, that's technology. 
okay? And the fact that it is now um, so, you know, there's, and, and this is a huge challenge, okay? Uh, if we were, you know, another day talking about what are the really big challenges facing this country, it's not trade with China, okay? What, 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 the way the United States keeps track of employment categories, the most common job in the entire United States, and some of this is a function of how the government does its stats, is truck driver, okay? I'll stand up here and make a bet that in five years probably, and in 10 years surely, those jobs are gone, okay? The conversation we need to be having as a country isn't do we slap tariffs on goods from China, it's how are we gonna deal with that kind of a challenge? That's technology. My name is Marcia Curran. I've been not against free trade, but I am questioning the way they set up the dispute settlement mechanism in a lot of these trade packs. And I think that's why many people were against the TPP and also the fact that a number of products were really protected in those trade packs, like mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals yep. and so on. Uh, you didn't mention anything about that, and I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about what we can do about a better trade settlement mechanism, dispute settlement mechanism. Sure. Um, so some of the people who argued against the Trans-Pacific Partnership did so on very principled grounds. Um, I have colleagues who would stand up and make a very convincing case that huge portions of uh, the, that trade agreement were in fact written by people in the pharmaceutical industry to protect certain IP in particular ways. Um, and over, you know, in, in terms of settlement mechanisms, um, it's always complicated because for example, the World Trade Organization, which is the biggest dispute settlement organization uh, for, for trade disputes, I mean, they don't have an army. So they can levy uh, rulings, but, and, and they take years and years to get to, uh, and at the end of the day, there's not a, an obvious enforcement mechanism for some of this stuff. Um, so, the other thing with Trans-Pacific Partnership to keep in mind is the rest of the world didn't stand still when we said no. Um, and China has jumped in and has viewed this, I believe, as a tremendous opportunity to increase its influence. So, um, you know, there's an argument out there that um, TPP wasn't perfect, uh, but by not signing on to it, we've opened the door to letting others uh, essentially drive the train um, and perhaps in ways that are less beneficial than TPP would have been. Good, e Good evening and first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, over here. I can't see, I, I've got lights, so I can't see. Okay. Good evening and thank, thank you. you for your presentation. You stated at the outset that uh, economists are in agreement that free trade is a good thing. Overall, and, yes. Overall, and that uh, regardless of the political party that won in November of 16, uh, it was likely to be damaged uh, by, by political pressures. Uh, that would suggest that eliminating or reducing free trade is a political, not an economic decision. What is likely to happen and what is likely to be promised by the political leaders as they restrict free trade and then what is likely to happen relative to the benefits to the country, both economically, socially, and politically? So now you're asking me to make predictions. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think we're gonna see a spate of protection. Um, I, I, the, I, the recent tariffs that were announced on, say, solar, solar panels is one example. Um, what's gonna happen? At some level, I think, People who expect, and this comes back to a point I was making in response to the other question, a lot of people are gonna come to the realization that all of this protection might 
at fairly high economic cost, bring production back, but it's just not going to bring the jobs back. Okay? Um, so, you know, you, you can put tariffs on solar panels, you can beat up on uh, clean energy with trade policy all you want. Um, it's a little hard to see that that's going to create jo more jobs in, in, in coal mining. You can keep, jo you know, you can keep uh, electronics from East Asia, you can keep uh, textiles and apparel, all of that stuff out of the country if you really want to. Um, and yes, you'll move production to this country if the policies are draconian enough, but you're just not going to bring the jobs back because those factories are going to look a lot like that one in South Carolina that I visited. And at some level, at some point in time, I guess people are going to figure this out. Yeah. Uh, professor, you talked about winners and losers, and the fact that it would be great if the winners were willing to subsidize the losers, but winners rarely do that. You also talked about the pace of automation uh, is killing jobs, and it seems like a pretty hopeless uh, future. Uh, does the radical proposal for a national guaranteed minimum income have any uh, role to play in this? Um, okay, so now, now we're, we're firmly on the, on away from things people would agree on and, and more into things that are more like pure speculation. Um, okay, first off, I'm not pessimistic about jobs, okay? Yes, there's tremendous automation, and yes, people who are, have a high school education and are driving a truck right now and are expect to be doing that 10 years from now are in a bad way. Yes, I, 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 I agree with that. Um, I'm pretty optimistic, okay? And people will say, where, did the, where are the jobs going to come from? And it's hard for me to, I think it's hard for any of us to answer that. I'm always reminded by the story of at the turn of the, uh, from in 1900, if you'd have told somebody that New York City would have, you know, three, four million people, they would have said, that's physically impossible. Where are you going to put all the horses? Okay? <laughs> Things change in ways that I think are hard for us today to understand. Um, but I, I'm actually, I, I'm not pessimistic about jobs. These uh, very dystopian views that all the jobs are going to disappear, so what are we going to do? I don't buy it. I, I don't think that's where we're headed at all. We have, some, we have some college students in the audience. What should they be studying? <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm actually a freshman and sophomore advisor for Yale College students. There's at least one Yale College student in the audience tonight. They should study whatever interests them. But Good they evening. should study. <laughs> Good evening, sir. You mentioned the name of Bangladesh. Yes. Actually, I'm from Bangladesh. My name is Gulam Rabbani. And Bangladesh is a labor incentive, a minimum wage-based country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned in the name of free trade, actually we are not practicing fair trade. So as economists, do you think is there, for this economics, is there anything behind any global politics? Or do you think the Bangladesh, we are the garment sector, we are the largest exporter in garment sector. So fair practice, just example, Walmart, they are influencing, insisting, and pressuring for trade union in Bangladesh, but they are not practicing trade in here. So what do you think? Is there any global politics for this, for this free trade or fair trade? So I, I have a pretty clear understanding in my head of what free trade looks like. Um, I don't have that same understanding for what exactly fair trade is. You know, is it fair trade to, for rich countries to impose U.S. labor standards on poor countries with which they're trading? I don't know. Is it fair trade to impose uh, intellectual property protections for pharmaceuticals that are sold to people who, if they don't break the IP, couldn't afford them? 
I, I don't have answers for you, in, in large part because I think fair trade is a very amorphous view. Uh, I don't know that economics really has a lot of answers to some of these questions. Um, we, we can analyze the impacts of policies, but what should those policies be, I, I think, is a much harder question. Um, climate is another one, you know. Should, uh, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of, of dimensions on which this issue arises. I, I, I'm grateful that you raised them, but I don't have answers. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Raphael, and um, I have uh, a question for you. I um, did a lot of work on U.S.-Japan trade relations in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and one of the things that strikes me about our situation with China is back in the day, the U.S.-Japan trade issues and the trade imbalance were driven by principally Japanese companies selling goods in the United States and then adjusting over time like automobile manufacturers come here. In the case of the China trade, the thing that struck, has struck me so far, it's almost all American companies that are driving the imbalance. They're sourcing goods, parts, finished products in China and bringing them back to the United States. So it's not really a U.S.-China competition so much as what's happening in the corporate world and you know, the ever increasing drive for profits, et cetera, et cetera. And so I wonder in your analysis, it seems to me that's the future, um, that the, just the nature, the structure of trade has changed. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that and what the implications of that may be in terms of looking for policy solutions if we're working in the capitalist system and U.S. companies are free to go wherever they want and, and do business as they choose. And the second point, I don't, let me ask another real quick question. We know that also American companies now are in China, um, particularly automobile companies manufacturing there and selling those, selling there. Do those numbers end up in trade figures or are they just, uh, they're buried somewhere else because it's not really trade per se? So, um, probably with multiple questions is trying to remember the first one. Um, uh, um, yes, the, the structure of trade is a little bit different now than it has been in the past because as you intimate, an awful lot of trade is in what economists call intermediate goods. Okay? So a lot of what's bought from China are things that are inside, you know, inside of our phones, uh, if not the phone itself or the phone is, is assembled there, but then sold by an American company here. Um, the big difference, I think, to the fact that there's so much trade in these intermediate products shows up in the politics, though, not the economics. So um, our current president has said, you know, he wants to renegotiate NAFTA. Okay? Um, a lot of auto parts are made inexpensively, relatively inexpensively, south of the border in factories owned by U.S. automobile firms. Okay? Now, you might think U.S. automobile firms would be all for, uh, perhaps, uh, rolling back NAFTA. They opposed it in the beginning, at least in some cases. Um, but things have changed. When you think about uh, tariffs on any intermediate input, the people who are going to argue against that are going to be the companies, the CEOs, proxying for the shareholders of these companies that benefit from getting lower cost inputs. And in general, I'm cynical enough to think that the politics are different when it's the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies um, arguing against uh, trade policies, uh, or for, in this case, for freer trade than if it was for, you know, just uh, groups of consumers. So I think the intermediate inputs aspect changes the politics. A um, little less clear that it changes the economics. Is there, uh, is, is South Korea then more like Japan in that we, we get Samsung products, but they're not American companies that have built things in China. 
and import them back to us. We're not buying Chinese television sets, even though they're all made in China. Uh, there, is there a Actually, different I'm model? Not, I'm not sure many TVs are made in China, but yeah, okay. anyway. Yeah. Um, but computers and things, uh, yeah. they're still carrying American brand names, per se, or what we think are American brand names. Uh, but th there it, seems to be a different kind of model that was yeah. just referred to Japan as early in its development, and then uh, Korea now. Yep. I mean, for sure, the global supply chain makes all of this a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you for coming. I'm taken by your South Carolina technology example. My question is that one of the biggest ways we spend money is with our national defense. And as we look toward the future and that budget keeps getting bigger, is there foresight that the technology line item is bigger than the tank? Light, line item. I'm sorry, it's bigger than the what? It's bigger than tanks that we need. We're going to need a lot of technology in a part of, as a part of our future. So I'm a little bit of a outlier on this one. I, I recently met with the, um, with the founder and CEO of the company that uh, produces the Predator drone, unmanned aircraft, um, out in San Diego. The company is General Atomics. And there are a lot of changes in technology right now that can drastically, drastically reduce the cost of having yet more effective defense policies. Um, unmanned aircraft are a fraction, a small fraction of the cost of a fighter jet. Um, but, but the Air Force doesn't want them because you, you, there's nothing for the pilots to do. Uh, instead, you, you know, it's 26-year-olds sitting in a, tra in a trailer in Nevada. Um, so, again, I, the, the economics of this are such that I believe technology can actually solve a lot of problems, make our country safer, and it drastically reduced cost. Um, but the politics are getting in the way, and I have no solutions there. Um, you, you're better at that than I am, I'm sure. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to Professor Jim Levin. Thanks. Thank you so much.